We are pleased to present Conversations About Music with Irene Oakner. Irene and her family are longtime members of Temple Gates of Prayer. Irene has worked closely with Hazan Bear and Rabbi Biller to create musical services for our congregation. She has a Master of Arts in Music, summa cum laude, from the Aaron Copeland School of Music, City University of New York. Irene looks forward to sharing her love of music with you. And at the end of her presentation, there will be time for questions. And now it is my pleasure to present Irene Oakner. Yay! Bravo! 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 <laughs> Thank you, and welcome to Conversations About Music. Oh, I can hear my voice reverberating from my husband's phone. Hold on just one second. Uh -oh. Everyone, please mute yourselves so we can hear Irene. Mm -hmm. I hear that the reverberation going. Yeah. Okay. Roman, did you mute? Because I hear the reverberations. Uh, Anne and Larry, if you could just mute people, if those who forgot to mute themselves, just in case. Great. Welcome to conversations about music. I think everyone will agree if I say that it is simply impossible to imagine our world without music in it. Music has the power to express human emotions, thoughts, and dreams. It is deep enough to become a part of religious rites in many cultures. It can magically intensify feelings, awaken visions of heaven, spiritual tranquility, and eternity. Music was born out of collective life. It helped to bring people together in singing and dancing. Transcending time, music can tell stories of the earliest civilizations in the world. The six of the earliest civilizations were Sumeru Babylonia, North the Chico of North Central Coastal Peru, the Minoan civilization on the island of Crete and other Aegean islands, ancient Egypt, the Indus River Valley civilization, and ancient Israel. Three of them, Sumeru Babylonia, ancient Egypt, and ancient Israel, we will visit today. The topic of our first conversation is music of ancient lands. The Torah names the very first musician to be Yuval, the son of Lana and Eda, and a descendant of Cain. The description of the three sons of Lana appeared in the chapter four of the book of Genesis and introduced the three primeval professions essential to nomadic life being a horseman, musician, and smith. Interestingly, Jewish tradition recorded music as the earliest form of art, one basic to human nature. Yuval was addressed as the ancestor of all who played the tenor, lyre, and the ugav, pipe. But the words musician or music did not appear in the sentence. These words, came from the Greek word musike, which meant the art of the muses. We fly seven chapters ahead and land in Sumer, Babylonia, modern day southern Iraq. And here I'm going to share with you a few pictures I prepared. As you can see, we landed in Sumer, Babylonia, and other neighboring lands. Uh, you could clearly see, I made a sign of here, uh, that city-state of Ur on the bank of the river Euphrates is right here. That's the place we need to see. According to the Genesis, Patriarch Abraham was born around year, the year uh, 1812 BCE in the 10th generation from Noah as Avram, son of Terah, in the town of Ur, one of the urban centers of the land. Terah and Abraham, Abraham brothers, his wife Sarai, 
his nephew and brother-in-law, Lot, were all born in Ur and lived there for decades. Abraham was around 70 when his father took him, Sarai, Lot, in their household and set out for Canaan. To travel to Canaan, you cannot go through the sands of a desert. You cannot move this way. You have to go up around here and then come down to Canaan. So what memories of Ur could they bring with them? What did Abraham hear and see in the ancient land of Sumer Babylonia, where he was born? Sumer Babylonians were the first to use bronze for their tools and spoke wheels for their vehicles. They gave the world the timing structure where an hour was divided into 60 minutes and a minute into 60 seconds. Most importantly, Sumer Babylonians were the first people to invent a writing system. They recorded commercial transactions and at the time of Abraham, Hammurabi's code of law. That writing system was copied and used by the neighbors on that map of ours, you could see. Uh, Hittites right here in the hilly area, Hurrians right here, Urardians in the Urartu mountains um, region. By the way, that triangle, that's Mount Ararat, the place where Noah's Ark has landed. What the system was that? Let me show you. What you see on your screens is a kenya form. The system of music kenya forms was developed by Sumer Babylonians. It developed from simple pictographs uh, in the abstract science uh, wedged on a clay tablet with a blunt reed stylus. Afterwards, the tablet was baked to be preserved for a very long time. On a photo, this one, uh, a music senior form presents you with such uh, signs. We cannot really read them, but I think they were um, decoded recently. They were decoded. They could be decoded. Next picture. Um, music notation as a Kenya form uh, was discovered in the 20th century. In 1927, Sir Leonard Woolley, um, British citizen, um, citizen uh, did a uh, was um, one which um, supervised archaeological digging at the Royal Cemetery of Ur. As it demonstrated, musicians and dancers were buried in royal tombs together with their courtiers, assistants, and soldiers to attend to their king and queen in the other life. Notice the group of women. Let me zoom in on that. And pull it closer. Notice the group of women right here, standing close to two Liars, that's one. Can you see clearly what I'm showing? I hope I already zoomed in here and another. Uh, at the dig at the Royal Cemetery of Ur, uh, they found the remains of 74 bodies. Among them were two, um, actually 15, elaborate, elaborately dressed women. Um, arranged in rows around a set of five lyres. One was decorated in gold. The scientists call it the queen's lyre. Another one in silver. Both were adorned with the bull's and cow's head in front. The other three wooden lyres turned to dust at the first touch, but the gold and silver plated lyres with tiny golden and silver nails attaching the cover, cover to the wooden base uh, the scientists were able to save. They poured wax over the lyres, let it harden, and then gently lifted the instruments out of the pit. The two lyres of Ur are considered to be the world's oldest surviving string instruments. Today, 
They are restored and shown at the British Museum, as you see on the picture, along with almost 130,000 clay senior forms. As you see, the golden liar's legs, right here, the liar to your left, right here, are preserved. That is important detail because it showed that the liars could be played standing on a podium. Both liars have 11 strings and the strings are connected with the tuning packs right on top here. By making the string tighter or looser, you can actually change the pitch of music. Next picture. In ancient Sumer Babylonia, the lyres were favored for its sweet voice by the priests and oracles. They were also popular much later among the Israelite psalmists and prophets. Lovingly, Sumerians used to decorate their lyres with bright colors of lapis lazuli, shell, and pink limestone. Modern Canadian musician and composer Peter Pringle built a wooden aluminum plated replica of the silver lyre of Ur, following all the measurements and specifications of the ancient instrument. He studied the descriptions of the Sumer Babylonian melodies and wrote music based on those descriptions. Let us hear Peter Pringle playing his music written in the style of ancient Sumer Babylonians and performed on his own replica of the silver Liar of Ur. I'm going to switch from the pictures to the video. Uh, have to, I'll have to say that because of all the lagging of the Zoom system, of Zoom features, uh, we might experience a slightly blurrier uh, image when in regular viewing of the video from YouTube. Um, unfortunately, I cannot help it. I hope everyone will still recognize a beautiful silver layer of four. Here we go. And here, I would like to stop that video. I mean, we got the idea what it is. I'm gonna pause it. I'm gonna stop share.
Yes, hold on. All right, okay, we're back in, in our reality. And I'm gonna ask everybody uh, who heard the music to please unmute themselves because I'm gonna ask you a simple question. After listening to me a little bit, what I got to say, um, and listening to the example uh, imitation of the authentic ancient uh, Sumerian Babylonian music. How can you describe it? Was it really as soothing and tranquil as the ancient people claim? Yes. <laughs> How do you like it? Oh, I, it brought me to another, another plane. It was just gorgeous my my spirit was rising really Wonderful. very very ethereal um just just beautiful great I, nobody's falling asleep yet no, <laughs> it's not real really enough i'm just no, asking no, you. Not at all. are you ready for the one the beat for the very for the relaxing week? and the the tone you know mm. it was like slow for the next so the next sound came, so it had time to, to stop and think. Very quick question. Was it made from one string that was tied at each point so that you could have so Very different good sounds? Peter Pringle describes how he made these particular steps of making this particular seal, uh, copy, copy, replica of the silver lyre of four. Of course, he didn't use silver exactly. It was aluminum plated, as I think I mentioned. And he mentioned that he used silk for the strings, mm. especially, especially processed silk. Uh, because um, in terms of vibration of strings, the audio effects it could produce, that was his um, chosen material. And I think, he didn't he do a wonderful job? Oh, yeah. You know, Irene? One of the things that we know uh, from um, uh, from from the Bible uh, and and the Jewish tradition is that King David was especially skilled as uh, as uh, the player of the kinor of the lyre. That's right. And that, uh, I'm not talking about David yet. I'm so sorry. We are still in Sumer Babylonia. David okay. has not been born yet. <laughs> <laughs> True, but the effect is the same. It's really That's neat right. to hear it. That's right. Really neat. Very, very tranquil. Very tranquil effect. Thank you so much, Kazan Bear. Yeah, uh, Irene. To, well, I, to the next land. Yes. Uh, I, I was wondering uh, how the music was written down. They, well, they as must I mentioned, have had... there were Kenya forms, and I cannot read those signs. Uh, but some specialists can because it, uh, actually uh, they tried for a very long uh, time and they did decode some of them. Uh, so it was written down. Oh. The system of it, I do not know. I cannot comment more on it because it's just not my field. I cannot tell you more. But you saw visually how the Kenya form looked, uh, a clay okay. tablet. And these signs probably produced uh, some kind of information as to the movements of the melody, um, as to the character of the music, because um, Peter Prinkle tried to follow these instructions, decoded instructions, and created this composition, beautiful composition, which I hope you enjoyed too. You know, Thank I read it very much. It was beautiful. Yes. Irene, yes. there was something about that sound that was, even though it was exotic and different, there was something about it that was modern and familiar at the same time. That's right. So it, we could relate to it too. It wasn't completely out of our range of, you know, understanding, perception. Right. I'm glad you like it. Let us move on forward. Okay, so we listened to the music of a silver or, um, lyre of Ur. Besides serving the lawyer, uh, royal court, singers, dancers, and inst instrument players were hired by the nobility to play love songs for the celebrations, participate at the funerals and temple ceremonies. Both the singers and the priests were hereditary posts, and the young priests were trained in schools at the big temples. Sumer Babylonia. The singing during the services was done responsively by the priest and the congregation or 
antiphonally by two choral groups. This technique was later picked up by the ancient Israelites. Besides lyres, in the Babylonian temple's musical ensemble were single and double pipes built like modern oboes, big and small drums, clappers, and rattles. We return to Patriarch Abraham. On the way to Canaan, remember the map? He and his company would cross the river Euphrates to become the first Irim or Hebrews, people from the other side of the river. They would make a five year long stop at the town of Haran, that's at the southmost uh, part of the map, and continue without terror on their journey to Canaan, where Abraham had a vision of God. He built his first altar to God in Shechem, second one near Bethel. Because of the severe famine, Abraham soon fled to Egypt and stayed there for approximately a decade. His return to Canaan was preceded by a mystical encounter with Hashem, announcing the covenant between him and Abraham's descendants, forever God's chosen people. Now, I have another question for you. Abraham's father, Terah, stayed in Haran, did not go to Kenya, and was buried there. According to the Jewish tradition, who among well-known people of Torah was born in Haran later? Uh, Moshe, Moshe, Hazan Bear, please do not answer this question. <laughs> Let's just hear the rest of our congregants. You're safe. Friends, I'll repeat the question again. According to the Jewish tradition, who among well-known people of Torah was born in the town of Haran later? Who knows the answer? People, you can unmute yourself because I, ca I cannot hear any anything. Who wants to unmute an answer? If not, I, I have an answer too. All right, the answer is Rebecca and her brother Lavan, Lavan's daughters, Leah and Rachel, 11 out of 12 sons of Jacob and his daughter Dina were all born in or right near Haran in the land, in the ancient land of Padanaram. We are returning with, we actually, we are not returning. We are not returning with Abraham to Canaan, but staying in ancient Egypt. It's our second stop, the new kingdom, for a bit longer. Let me share screen again with you. Share screen. Now, going to the first, yes, we're at the map again. 200 years had passed and another great famine swept the territories northeast of Egypt. The hungry people of many lands, including the Hebrews, Abraham and Sarah's grandson, Jacob, his 11 sons and their household, traveled toward the fertile delta of the Nile River in search of provisions. They settled in the region of Goshen. Later, Jacob and Leah's great-grandson, Amram, from the tribe of Levi, was born there. He was born in Egypt, where Joseph was still a governor, married to the daughter of the Egyptian priest from Heliopolis. I have a question. I don't want to go uh, cancel my share, uh, screen sharing. I'll just ask it out loud. Who knows what was the name of Joseph's wife and how many children did they have together? Anybody? I think they had two children. Correct. And what two was the sons. name of Joseph's wife? I don't remember, but I think they had two sons. Menashe and Ephraim. Absolutely yeah, correct. Yeah, Menashe right. and Ephraim. And, then, and you make a blessing that you bless the children and you want the boys to be like Menashe and Ephraim, but I don't know the name of the wife. You know That's name? right. Joseph and his wife, Asinaf or Asnat, I actually know the person right now, a good friend of mine, her name is Asnat, which is Asinaf from the Torah. 
had two boys, Menashe and Ephraim. Asenath was the daughter of the Patifera, a priest of Heliopolis. Another question, uh, a bit more complicated. Uh, you don't have to answer if you don't know. What is the connection between Heliopolis, where the priest, father of Asenath was from, and New York? Oh. <laughs> what is the connection between Heliopolis and New York? <laughs> I'll give 15 seconds to think and then I'll answer. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll tell you. The ancient Egyptian city of Heliopolis was the original location of three obelisks named Cleopatra's Needle. The name was a misnomer since it had no connection to the Egyptian queen and existed for thousands of years before her lifetime. One of the obelisks was given to the American Consul General at Cairo as a gift. It was brought to New York and in 1881 erected in Central Park. It's still in New York. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. we are moving on. By the time Amram, son of Kohath, married his father's sister, you have it. Interesting twist, right? Married his father's sister, you have it. The glory of Joseph's life was already forgotten. The pharaohs after Joseph's time had subjected all Hebrews living in their land to slavery. Amram's daughter, Miriam, born ahead of her brothers, Aaron and Moses, was the daughter of slaves. Through her wit and the Egyptian princess Batia's kindness, Moses was saved from certain death, taken out of the water in na and named accordingly. He was raised in a palace, observing the customs, art, and culture of the privileged. What did Moses see and hear while growing up in Egypt? We are looking at the map uh, and while we're looking at the land of Egypt right here, uh, let, let's hear a bit about their culture. Ancient Egyptians are credited with the creation of the first solar calendar, tracking the position of the earth rotating around, around the sun. It also marked the reappearance of the star Sirius, which was the start of the annual flooding of the Nile River. The ancient Egyptian calendar had only three seasons, each consisting of 120 days, flooding, growth, and harvest. Five days outside of that cycle were a holiday, honoring the children of God. Let me show you that calendar. Fragment of the ancient Egyptian calendar is right in front of you. I cannot unfortunately read the names of months or days, but there is certainly a system, some kind of a calculation and a cycle going, calculating, uh, showing all the um, things happening during the calendar year. One more picture. The shaving, cutting and fixing of hair to beautify a person also started from ancient Egypt. By the New Kingdom times, and all adult males, Egyptian males, shaved their heads and facial hair regularly to protect themselves against the blazing sun, dry air, and the abundance of bugs. The boys had their side lock of hair, right here in blue color, cut off at around their 11th birthday during their circumcision. Women and men wore wigs another Egyptian invention, made out of human and animal hair or vegetable fiber, depending on the social status of a person. Notice their luxurious white linen robes. The man and the boy are dressed very, uh, in very rich clothing. clothing. Uh, these robes are so thin, they're almost sheer. Linen did not take dye well and often was kept in its natural shade of bleached white. Flax was a major crop in ancient Egypt. 
It provided the fi fiber for the linen that Egyptians wore throughout their lives. And even after death, they were being wrapped in it. Next picture. Both medicine and magic were used to preserve people's health. The ancient Egyptians believed that even applying cosmetics was a form of magic. Unadorned eyes were left unprotected and vulnerable, vulnerable to evil. Bright eye shadows made from ground lapis lazuli, azurite, lead, or malachite gave the whole face a superhuman, godlike quality. For lips and cheeks, they used ground lead, red ochre mixed with water and applied with a brush. Do we see those large cones on top of the ladies' heads? Let me show these ones. Let me actually move it down so you could see it better. Do you see those cones on ladies' heads? What do you think they were? These are perfume cones made from animal fat injected with the essence of oil of flowers. As they melted from the heat, they would release the scent. Ancient Egyptians invented also wooden toothpicks and toothbrushes. Their toothpaste was an appetizing mixture of ashes, burnt eggshells, pumice, and the ox hoofs powder. Privileged care for their bodies during their lives and preserved them for the next life. Mummification was a sophisticated ritual where priests prepared the body for crossing over and waking up in the next world thus overcoming death. Almost a mile long linen cloth was used to thoroughly wrap a mummy and its organs and to preserve them for many centuries ahead. Now I wanna ask another question. Attention, please. Which organ was left untouched inside the mummified body and why? I'll repeat. The heart. Sorry? The heart. The heart. Excellent. The heart is correct. Uh, the heart was the only organ left in the body. It was believed to be the person's center of intelligence needed in the afterlife. Guess what? Brain did not matter. It was sucked out of the uh, human's head through the straw through the nose. Only the heart was left in the body. Next picture. Wait, I have a question. Sure. Um, you said that oil was injected into the animal fat, but how 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 did they oils, inject I'm it? I'm sorry, I probably mis uh, misspoke. It was oils or anim animal fat was injected with oil from uh, uh, essence of flowers, and fat could store that essence for a long time, slowly melting in the hot summer of the ancient Egypt. So how did they inject it? Did they have syringes? Did they, like... <laughs> I don't know. That I cannot exactly tell you. I guess they had some kind of a device to inject it. Moving on. Now on the picture, you can see papyrus plant growing in water. Ancient Egyptians developed the art of writing and invented paper and, link, and ink to write. The paper they used was made from the pith of the papyrus plant which was growing in abundance in the marshlands of the Nile Delta. And it was also used for woven goods and food and fragrance as well. Hebrew and Egyptian word for papyrus is gome. And in the book of Exodus, the wicker basket you have it put her baby in is also named gome. Scribes wrote on parchment with reed brushes dipped in ink, made out of brightly colored minerals, grounded into powder and mixed with liquid. The papyrus scroll was in constant use until parchment made from animal skins became popular in the second century BCE. On the photo, you could see uh, our own New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art um, example of the ancient Egyptian papyrus writing.
The writing system was known as hieroglyphics, which consisted of almost 800 symbols. Each hieroglyph represented a sound of a common object or an idea associated with that object. Hieroglyphs were read right to left, like Hebrew. They did not use spaces or punctuation. Through the study of hieroglyphs, researchers have learned that there were many ancient Egyptian musical instruments. They had a harp and a dancer's lute, small and light and easy to move with. Egyptian trumpets could be made out of both wood and metal. Wind instruments included pipes, single pipes and double pipes of different lengths that played like modern oboes, although sometimes they were referred to as flutes. The longer were pipes, the lower was their sound. There was a big variety of percussion instruments, clappers, rattles, scrapers, cymbals, timbrels, uh, gifted the music with the magic of its rhythm, of their rhythm, which kept the listeners captivated. On, on our screens, we see a whole musical ensemble playing for the queen and being accompanied by her hand clapping. That's very important, the clapping of hands given its steady rhythm to singing was considered sacred. The music was represented by a hieroglyph in the shape of a raised arm. The gesture meant playing music, singing, musician, or music conductor. Unlike Sumer Babylonians, ancient Egyptians did not have musical notation, passing from the melodies from one musician to another. However, their musical instruments have survived. And from those, it was possible to reconstruct the range of their sounds. One more picture right here. The wall reliefs of the temples and tombs portray different musical instruments and a technique in which these instruments were played and tuned. The positions of the hands on the harp strings and the distance of the lute frets showed the intervals played and the musical harmonies arranged to accompany the singing. It is known that the intervals of perfect fourth, perfect fifth, and octave were the most common in ancient Egyptian compositions. There's a whole band here. On the picture, uh, the highest status for a musician in ancient Egypt was a temple musician. Since playing music was a, for a particular god or goddess, placed someone in a high position in the society. Female singers and dancers often officiated at religious ceremonies and the choreography of the dance imitated the story of the song or demonstrated some difficult acrobatics. Besides being temple musicians, performers could be working on a freelance basis. They entertained at evening meals, social gatherings, singing love songs accompanied by dance. As you can see from the picture, the Sumer Babylonian's lyre in ancient Egypt was replaced by either a long and stretched harp the one to the left, with a wide and curved border, or a small hand-hand lyre, the one to the right, which was played while standing and walking. It was common to decorate the harp with precious materials such as ebony, silver, gold, lapis lazuli, and malachite. The outline of the harp became a musical hieroglyph. Often, ancient Egyptian musical instruments were inscribed with the name of Hathor, the goddess of music the Egyptian goddess of music, joy, feminine love, and motherhood. She was often represented with the head, horns, or ears of a cow. On the picture, in this picture, you can see some of the most popular instruments played in the New Kingdom. Out of six instruments, three are clappers, the timbrel or the hand drum, and sistrum are noisemakers. The sistrum, the one to the right, here it is, that's a sistrum, is a handheld rattle, mainly played by women. Its Greek name means that which is shaken, and the Egyptian's name for it is seshet. Such, just like a harp, the sistrum had a hieroglyph created in its image. It was known for its metallic sound, produced by small metal discs, strung together and set into a frame. When moved from side to side or up or down, they created an attractive sound and a fascinating 
almost hypnotic rhythm. Asian people compared that sound to a stem of papyrus being shaken or a sacred Egyptian cobra hissing and moving around. Just listen to how its names are pronounced. Sistrum, Sashet. The bright sound of shaken metal discs was believed to protect from the demons and bring divine blessings to all who listened. The sistrum's handle was often decorated with the head of the goddess Hathor, and its frame's outline imitated Hathor cow horns. So this presumably is the face of the goddess, and this is the frame which kind of puts together two cow horns in that frame shape. The sistrum would be shaken by a priestess to accompany her singing during the open air processions towards the temple. Out of all musicians in the long procession, only the priestess with her sistrum in the hand would enter the temple. Let's imagine a slow procession of women singing, playing pipes and sistrums as they walked, while we listen to a musical reconstruction of ritual ancient Egyptian music. It was written after a thorough ethnomusicological research by Australian composer and instrumentalist, Michael Atherton. Hold on a second, I'm switching to video. I'll do it and I'll show a few more pictures. Okay, I'll stop it here. And I stop my share because I have a few more questions for you. And we have to move on to the most important stop of the day, the stop of ancient Israel. Okay. Question for everybody. Hold on. You could unmute yourself if you want. How did you like the reconstructed ancient Egyptian music? Do you think that reconstructing music the way Michael Atherton and Peter Pringles did is a valid, valid way to represent music of the Asian cultures? What do you think? Anybody? You could unmute yourself. Let How me you unmute like this music. Yeah. Oh, that was otherworldly, really. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you. I liked it too. That's why I picked it up for, for the... It's, for the... It was beautiful. I would have liked to have heard some more of it. I could have listened well, to that. Actually, more. It's very short. Right after I stopped oh. it, a few more seconds, there will be pipes going. Oh. Uh, oh. It's a very short uh, wow. audio of system to begin with. But you could imagine, kind of yes. imagine through that short fragment, how the procession was moving, how the priestess were shaking her system, and how just two of them, the system, and the priestess were entering the temple afterwards. 
but yeah fascinating that's like a magic that's what they imply to their most of their rituals the ancient egyptians thank you mm. for that comment anybody Thanks. else how did you like the music everyone is just speechless all right we are moving on forward our next step is ancient israel Sumer, Babylonia, and ancient Egypt left a record of their history in material things, like tombs and pyramids. Interestingly, the creators of ancient monuments have vanished with time. There are no Sumerians or Babylonians in our days, and the modern Egyptian people are not the ancient Egyptians we have discussed tonight. That's As true. Max Isaac Di Di Diamond, I think his name is pronounced, the Jewish-Finnish-American writer, um, author of the book Jews and um, God, God and History formulates what we know about the Jews during these ancient times is mostly the ideas they taught and the impact with this which these ideas had made upon other people and other civilizations. Mm -hmm. um, what a great, great um, sentence. The, thought. The ancient Israelites and their ideas have survived many serious challenges. Babylonia and Egypt, their massive population and a sizable territory, failed to do that. Welcome to the final step of our journey, ancient Israel. I hear my voice is very again, so I would ask everyone to please mute your computers. Thank you so much. It will be easier for you to listen. Thank you. 210 years have passed. I'm still your brain. Somebody give me this. Could you please mute your computers? Thank you. 210 years have passed. No, still there. Uh, M, can you mute everybody? It's not me. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll uh, mute everybody and then you can unmute yourself. Thank you. 200. Okay, now unmute yourself. Yes, ready. Good. Thank you. 210 years have passed since Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt and settled in Goshen. Following God's voice, 80 year old Moses, together with Aaron and Miriam, is bringing Hebrews out of its rhyme to reach the promised land. As soon as the Hebrew slaves freed themselves from their past, physically and psychologically separating from it as they crossed the Red Sea, their first great victory song was born. Let me share with you um, images of our next stop, ancient history. It was recorded in the book of Exodus in, as the song of the sea or Shirat Hayam, sung by Moses and the children of Israel. I could still hear someone, I don't know where. <laughs> okay, I continue. Unity in reaching the same go goal at this moment was reinforced by joining the voices in the consistent phrase. As the commentary to chapter 15 states, until this moment, no one had sung praises to God, not Adam after having been created, not Abraham after being delivered from the fiery furnace, not Isaac when he was spared the knife, or Jacob when he escaped from the wrestling with an angel and from Esau. But then Israel came to the sea and it parted for them. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. You could see on the on your screens that, um, as the commentary says, this song has a special layout, which visually resembles bricks in a wall. The alternating words represent the two walls of the split sea with Israel walking down in the middle. Moving on to the next image. As the men rejoiced, Miriam and other women sang and danced to their own tune accompanied by timbrels. Isn't it amazing that among most precious things which Hebrew slaves had hurriedly taken from their Egyptian masters, 
facing the journey into the unknown were musical timbres? The medieval Torah and Talmud commentator Rashi answered the question in, in these words. The righteous women of the generation were so certain that the Holy One, blessed be he, would perform miracles for them. They took timbrels out of Egypt. The Torah stories are filled with the notion that it is natural for people to burst spontaneously into song or dance when moved by the wonders of God's creation. Moses, Miriam, Deborah the judge, and King David did exactly that. It is fascinating that, fascinating that one third of the books of the Torah are written in poetry, and one half of that is intended to be sung. Some biblical books, such as the books of Psalms, the Book of Lamentations, and the Song of Songs, are all songs and poetry. They are found in the third part of the Tanakh, Ketuvim, or writings. Relying on poetry is important. It is so much easier to sing and memorize poems rather than prose. Poetry transcends the limitations of non-poetic speech, daring to express the inexpressible and deliver us from the ordinary to extraordinary. Music plays an active part in biblical stories. It is happy, festive music at public gatherings where maidens of a Shiloh dance beside their vineyards. Vineyards, I'm sorry. And the king's coronations are announced by the blast of the horn and the playing of the flutes. In the two books of Chronicles, there are descriptions of ritual celebrations and the role music and musicians played in them. The authors of them most likely were Levitical singers since they presented detailed reports on music at the temple in the time of King David and Solomon. And so it is known that some 288 musicians played lyres, lutes, timbrels, sistrums and cymbals at the head of the procession than King David, just like on that picture. And all of the house of Israel dance before the Ark of Covenant, bringing it to Jerusalem. There is military music calling for the Israelites to advance. The city wall collapses when the sounds of the horn blown by the priests are joined at Joshua's command by the shouts of the people. The trumpets of Gideon the judge startle the enemies before the attack. Victory over the Canaanites uh, on Mount Tabor is commemorated in the song of Deborah the prophetess, expressing her praise to God for leading his, uh, his people in triumph. Music and dance are needed to make announcements, to heal and elevate the soul, and to ward off evil spirits. Hashem instructs Moses to make two silver trumpets, or hatzatzrot, and blow them in the days of gladness and solemn days, in the beginning of the month, over peace offerings and over burnt offerings. The bells, that's a little bit, this one. The belts of gold decorate the hem of the high priest's robes, and the sound of them is heard when he comes in and out of the sanctuary. And now, what Hazan Bear has mentioned, the lyre of the ancient Kinor, or Hebrew Kinor, is played to ward off the evil spirit from the first king of Israelites, King Saul, Saul or Shaul, by young David, son of Jesse, from the tribe of Judah. Music and dance are part of many rituals, and the prophets met by King Saul reach an ecstatic state by playing their lyres, timbrels, flutes and harps. As the musicians play, Elisha, the prophet, is brought into the prophetic state. The sons of Asaph, Haman, and Jedathan recited their prophecies to the accompaniment of lyres, harps, and cymbals. There are six percussion instruments mentioned in the Torah. They are Mananim, Rattles or castanets mentioned during King David's dancing with the ark. Metziltaim, me, sorry, metziltaim, small finger symbols producing a high-pitched tinkling sound played by Levites while singing. 
Tzilzilim as symbols. And Psalm 150 describes two kinds of them. Tzitzilei teruah, Tzitzilei shama, referring to high and low pitched symbols. Pa'amon is the bell sewn to the hem of the high priest's robe. Shalish is a system shaken by dancing and singing Israeli uh, women as they welcome King Saul and David. Timbrel or a small hand drum cited in the Song of the Sea is called in Hebrew Tov. There are seven wind instruments the Torah names for us. There are Ugav, a pipe, Halil, a double pipe, Nehilot, a lamentation pipe, Keren, a horn used in the book of Joshua, Yuval, a loud horn, a Haftetzra, a trumpet, played by priests and Levites at the temple, and of course, Shafar. Ram's horn is one of the earliest musical instruments known to humankind. First mentioned in the book of Exodus, at, revelation, at the revelation on Mount Sinai. Out of all ancient musical instruments, only the shofar would keep its unique role in Jewish rituals and be known among all communities throughout Jewish history. One of our future conversations about music could be dedicated entirely to the wonderful Asian shofar. There are three string instruments we are told about in the Torah. The word kinor or lyre appeared most often, 42 times. It was played in worship services, at banquets, um, and celebrations for government occasions. Nevel or harp often appears alongside kinor, as in King David's dance. It has a curved one-sided body with strings of uneven length and thickness. There is also a sore or small harp, which had 10 strings, since the word for 10 was Esser. According to the Book of Chronicles, the lyres were set to Alamov and the harps were set to Sheminit. The Alamov in Hebrew refers to maidens so the lyre sound was likened to the high-pitched singing voices of young women. The sheminif or eight refers to the octave of the modern eight note scale. So the instrument was pitched approximately one octave lower than its counterpart, parallel to the voice of the male singer of a temple choir. A symphony of instruments participating in the dedication of a King Solomon temple in Jerusalem, built at the top of Mount Moriah on the holy spot of Isaac Binding, are completed in seven years. King Solomon, one of the wisest and the most musical men of his generation, spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were a thousand and five. As the Ark of Covenant was brought from the city of David into the temple, all the Levitical singers stood on their east side of the altar, dressed in fine linen, maybe Egyptian one, and playing cymbals, harps, and lyres, accompanied by 120 priests sounding trumpets. What a magnificent event. Its glorious performance moved the chronicle to these words of appreciation. It came even to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. Notice here again the unity in music reinforcing the unity of a nation, reinforcing the union of the people of the community. The liturgy of the temple ritual had its prominent feature daily singing of, um, as its prominent feature, daily singing of the Psalms, which name in loose translation from Greek means the words accompanying the music. Singing in a temple was not an easy task. The song leaders, Levites, served five-year apprenticeships before being admitted into the choir at the age of 30. They were the singers of antiphonal psalms, in which entire verses alternated between two choirs. The poetic lines of the psalms were built so they could be divided among the choir that way, the two choirs that way. The second choir was singing in unison half lines or simply replying, Amen. Why splitting of verses in half was so popular? The answer is simple. Since the prayer books did not exist and most people were not well versed in the liturgy, 
Antiphonal singing was likely the only option, option for the participation by the common Israelites, those pilgrims which came to Jerusalem. Please remember, when at our Kabbalat Shabbat services we're invited to sing responsibly with Hazan, with the Hazan, we are engaging in the ancient style of temple worshiping. Another temple practice is still alive and active today. It is the practice of elevating folk songs to ritual status for adapting their melodies to liturgical texts. In the Middle Ages, many PU teams or Puyutim or religious poems followed this pattern. In later, the Hasidim of Eastern Europe made it customary to elevate and adapt Russian and Ukrainian songs of the beginning of the 20th century for the service of God. If we would open the book of Psalms right now, we would see that Psalms have titles. I was talking about Hasidim of Eastern Europe, which made customary to elevate and adapt Russian and Ukrainian songs at the beginning of the 20th century for the service of God. If we would open, and I was reading from the books of Psalms, did you hear me at that point about the books of Psalms or not yet? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I was talking about different types of songs, and out of all, Psalm 150 is my favorite. It introduces a list of instruments, including those that were popular in ancient Israelite worship and used for secular purposes. Mm -hmm. It names timbrel and dance, both of which are associated with women. It is offering a stage direction. The Psalm shows the order in which the instruments should enter into the concert. The orchestra reaches its peak with an arrival of human voice, bridging past and present. Let us hear, in one minute, because I have to put it on YouTube, um, let us hear Psalm 150 played to music by Yaron Cherniak and Jamie Hilsden, performed by a Tel Aviv band, Mikadam, with Jewish musicians from 26 countries and six continents participating. They share their passion for music, rhythms, and biblical lyrics to bring us together in these trying times of disconnection and confusion to uplift us, renew our hope and a sense of wonder. Praise him with the blast of the horn. Hallelujah, Beteka Shafar. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Hallelujah, Benevel, Bekinor. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Hallelujah, Betov, Umahol. Praise him with the lute and, lute and pipe. Hallelujah, Beminim, Beugav. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Hallelujah, Betzelele, Shama. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Hallelujah, Betzelele, Terwa. Let every breath praise God. Kol Hane Shama, the Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give me one second with the video.
and so is this song. I love this particular clip. It's wonderful. And yeah, I have yeah. just a few more words to say to everybody for this. And hold on, I'll turn off that video. Hold on. I just have a few words for those patient enough who still are here and not asleep. Strong voices of our biblical ancestors recite to us the individual life stories. They come from different Asian lands and cultures, connected through trade, warfare, and migration. Voices mm -hmm. and stories of Abraham, Sarah, Jacob, Rachel, Leah, Moses, Aaron, Miriam, King David and King Solomon joined together to become the history of one great nation, reaching and settling in the promised land. The chorus of the ancient Israelites sing prayers to Hashem following the daily rituals of the monumental and awe-inspiring Jerusalem temple. In the words of Psalm 96, may we always continue to sing new songs to God. Thank you very much.